A new study by Cornell University finds that roughly one-fifth of the world's population could become climate change refugees by 2100. The majority of those will be people who live on coastlines around the world, including about two million in Florida alone. Escalating refugee migrations, rising waters, and hotter than ever summers may appear to be different crises, but in reality, they are rooted in a joint emergency, says today's guest. We better start addressing them simultaneously. To that end, Thanu Yakupitiyage came from New York's Immigration Coalition to work as the U.S. Communications Manager for Climate Justice Organization 350.org. She is clearly a connector. She's also a DJ. Thanu, welcome to the program. Glad to have you. Thank you for having me. So, um, this is kind of an interesting transition for you, going from immigrant rights work to the work that you're doing at 350. You were doing communications at both organizations, but what's changed? What's your new? Um, you know, I think uh, for me, I've been in the immigrant rights movement for um, a decade. I forever and always will consider myself a part of the immigrant rights movement, but I think I wanted a change. And I also wanted to work on um, things um, that had to do with broader broader impact because a lot of my work at the New York Immigration Coalition was around like, you know, the specifics of how do we like help support people to stay in New York, the, the tangibilities of like healthcare and education and access, which is so, so important. and clearly continues to be important during the Trump administration. But I'm also really, uh, I think it's important to, to take a step back and really think about why it is that migration happens. And I uh, wanted to create space for myself to do that. And so I transitioned to 350.org because, um, you know, I have a, a previous uh, background, uh, you know, growing up within the environmental justice movement in Asia. I'm from Sri Lanka and Thailand. Um, my dad does work on sustainable agriculture, and I just really think that this is the time to be connecting the dots between two of the largest issues um, that are facing all people. We are big believers in connecting the dots here on the Laura Flanders Show. Um, but before we go there, for a lot of people, they think about the migration crisis, the refugee crisis, and they say, well, aren't wars causing those crises? Yeah, absolutely. So that's one of the ways in which we need to think about um, the refugee crisis is like, or refugee crises are the multiple factors that actually lead to a refugee crisis. So if you even look at the situation in Syria, actually in 2008 or 2006, there was a major drought that happened in Syria. And that really impacted farmers in a lot of parts of Syria and caused all of this migration from um, the rural areas into the urban areas. And that was also one of the catalysts of um, you know, the Syrian refugee crisis or one of the, the catalysts for the conflict. And so when we look at what ha what's happening in Syria, certainly it's about war, but there's multiple factors that led to that situation. And so some would argue even that like the Syrian refugee crisis also actually has to do with climate. Yeah, I mean, it does seem as if our immigration, migration, refugee crises, all of which are somewhat different, are kept very separate from every other category, whether it is um, industrial policy or trade policy, or as you're talking about climate change policy, we don't want to talk about movements of people in, in connection with any of those things. Why? What, what, what do you, whose interest is being served by us keeping everything so compartmentalized? I would say nobody's interested in being served, <laughs> but okay, um, right. you know, I mean, even the term climate refugee is actually a really contested term. A lot of people won't use the term climate refugee because um, they feel like they still can't tangibly state, well, it's climate that's causing these people to migrate. And so I speak about it as um, you know, climate impacts, as climate-related migration, because it's always a, a number of factors. So even if you look at um, East Africa, you look at Chad, Sudan, one of the reasons why people are getting on these boats and crossing the Mediterranean, Mediterranean is because the conditions in their countries are unlivable now. Yeah. Drought, famine, um, which leads to political crisis, which escalates political crisis. And so um, even though people don't want to say that's a climate refugee, it is part of a climate impact. Yeah. No, is there a danger in, I mean, it's already, climate is already a big enough problem that some people feel overwhelmed. I know I sometimes do. Uh, is it dangerous to make it even bigger, if you, if you know what I mean? I mean, yeah, the climate in and of itself is extremely overwhelming, right? When people, you know, talk about climate change, even myself, you know, prior to being in the climate mode, I'd be like, oh, wow, that's bad. It really is getting hotter. And people don't know what to do. And so I think we're really in a moment where we really need to think about what we mean by intersectionality beyond just, 
saying the word, right? And so it's really important for people in the climate movement to really show up for the immigrant rights movement. It's really important for people in the immigrant rights movement to show up for the climate movement. Now, what about the steps since the climate march? What's been going on? Um, it did not stop Trump from exiting the Paris Climate Agreement, and we saw that happen um, in early June. But I think that what it's done is really um, intensify people's commitment to climate. Um, when you have an administration that is just rolling back any progress mm. we've made. Um, and so, you know, since then we've seen, you know, hundreds and hundreds of mayors, governors um, really stand up um, and say that they're going to take on, um, you know, the Paris Climate Agreement and meet the measures. And what we, what we, that's great in, you know, theory and that's great in um, rhetoric and so really the role of organizations like 350 is really to hold them accountable. Yeah, because it does seem like now what we have to do is have people say, now all people need to do is say, I'm for the Paris Accord, yeah, which exactly. most of us were not happy with in the first place, exactly. and they're suddenly climate heroes. Yeah, and I think that that's something that we have to be careful about, because I think there's been this like narrative over the, um, the last year of, uh, well, we're not Trump. Right. Um, and yet, you know, even if you look back at the Obama administration, you know, the whole resistance against the Dakota Access Pipeline actually happened during the end of the That's Obama right. administration. Um, a lot of major pushback against deportations happened during the Obama administration. He was considered the deporter in chief. Not over just two considered, point the statistics were he deported more people than anyone. Exactly. Over 2.5 million people were deported under, under, under Obama. And so I think that we need to actually really transition out of the, the rhetoric of resisting Trump into action what that looks like mm. tangibly in action. All right, so two things. One, what does that resistance look like tangibly in action? It was interesting to me that I saw one of the articles you'd written on The Root, and in the comments section, wow, there's a lot going on. You I have people saying, African Americans don't care about climate, they don't even drive hybrid cars. Then they had a comment about people saying, well, but this is, you know, white people have only been concerned about the Dakota pipeline, and they didn't even show up when we were being shot in the streets. How you bring these movements together and these communities together is clearly the work that you have taken on. How do you do it? I mean, this is the thing. Movements are messy. Movements yeah. are not uh, linear. Um, there's a lot of building that goes into that. And there's a lot of mistrust, um, understandably. And I think that it really takes people coming to the table over and over again, even if you get burned, in order to build a, a real movement that is multiracial, that is multi-issue, that really is beyond the buzzword of intersectional. So just thinking intersectionally for a second, I'm thinking about the way that we enforce our response to climate change. At least historically, that's been with government action, government regulation and inspection. If I'm thinking intersectionally about a population that's already over-policed and maybe doesn't have the most positive re relationship with federal officials or government officials, um, what does that as it were, enforcement look like on the climate front? I mean, I would say that there's a lot of local initiatives that it's not like, you know, when we talk about um, changes that we need in our communities, uh, communities of color are already making those changes. And so it's, it's not, and communities of color are also very wary, for example, of police presence. And so it's not to have it in, in, enforced in a, in a top-down way. I think there's a lot of um, you know, social education that needs to happen um, in order for communities to really advocate for themselves. Um, and I think, uh, so one of the campaigns that 350 will be launching in the fall is a, is a distributed local campaign, um, which is about um, communities all across the country really meeting, um, you know, pushing towards 100% renewables, uh, keeping no fossil fuels in the ground, and, and stopping infrastructure. And that's going to look different in different places. And we're a global organization, so what we do in the U.S. is not what it looks right. like in India or in Japan. So what can people do if they want to support your, and I'm, I know you're not alone, in, in this effort to really change and bring issues together and movements together? and have a real impact, what, what can they do? Maybe they've been supporters of 350 or they've been sort of mainstream environmentalists. How can they get on board? Well, first of all, go to 350.org and follow our work. But I think also like follow the work of other in, um, immigrant rights organizations. Um, ask questions uh, um, to these organizations about how they're bringing different movements together. Um, you know, I, I, like I, I recently heard someone say, well, you know, I have no time to deal with racial justice because um, saving the planet is a large enough task. And what I would say to that is that um, 
this idea, this meta idea of saving the planet actually requires that we figure out how to live and work together and create um, spaces that of less oppression. And so I don't think that these things are as separate as, as people like to, to put in their heads. I think you're right. <laughs> Anu, thank you so much for coming and it's great to thank meet you. Thank you so much.